ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथोज मुदीर नष्ट प्रायस्तु भद्रेशु नि भागवत सेविया भगवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर भगवती नष्ट के हरे कृष्णा जय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय सो वी कवर्ड अप टू चैप्टर 13 एज फार एज आई कैन रिमेंबर of the 13 and there are lots of chapters that we um we have yet to go through so I'll just go to screen and just go to 10th canto instructions and find out where <laughs> chapter 25 no 20 13 8 9 10 11 uh So, yeah. so it was wonderful that we had been going through the kartik month and in that month we have been uh, going through the radha damoda leela and then um, deliverance of these two wonderful uh, demigods nal kuvera and mani grave and the kol kartik month has been you know wonderfully celebrated um by these past times of and then we covered that wonderfully in lots of chapter so we've gone through all this section so we come to chapter 13 then so i think chapter 13 in the so this is where you know past times of lord brahma had stolen the cowherd boys and calves uh, it was all there for a moment Uh, from his perspective his time perspective so by using his mystic powers he has done that he you know and then and, and he, once he realizes what he has done and krishna has actually expanded himself into those same coward boys and calves and carried on this whole pastime uh, in vrindavan for the whole year and everybody felt different even the cows felt a different love for their calves because actually there was krishna expanded uh as calves and and the reciprocation was so different uh on a different level uh than would it would have been because even the coward boys and they all in and, and the, all the bridge buses felt kind of different because of this um this mystic potency of krishna because here it is said you know that although brahma has these mystic powers to kind of pick up all these coward boys on the and and put them to sleep and and hide them in a cave just to test krishna or he was he was trying to you show his mystic powers but then he was more mystified by krishna's supreme mysticism as he expanded into these coward boys so we see how even balaram could not understand all this at first so krishna is amazingly you know how he's been i think this lasted for about a year or so um from a brahm this time scale is on a different level of brahma so we can understand how in this material affection is contaminated by rajogun and tamogun but in the sudha sattva the affection that maintains the devotees is transcendental so sudha sattva is beyond satoguna as well uh and when we attain like we were saying yesterday when we keep on chanting we attain spiritual potency and more and more of the transcendental qualities uh, manifest then we are able to expre- express an experience sudha sattva uh this is what the in the spiritual world the, the residents of vrindavan and they reciprocate with krishna uh in full 
Satchit Ananda Vigraha form and is transcendental. Uh, so that's what we should understand. But while we are in the material world and all the relations that we experience, always contaminated with mode of passion and ignorance. And that's why we end up with uh, not reciprocating properly and not communicating properly and arguments, this, that. So, uh, but being in Satogun is good enough, you know, to have good relationships mm -hmm. and good reciprocation. Sudha Sattva is beyond. So this uh, pastimes of Krishna with coward boys and, and in Vrindavan, uh, even Balaram. So affection felt by the families and cows for Krishna's expanded forms of coward boys and calves was transcendental. And as we become more Krishna conscious, our desires and affection towards all living entities can become transcendental because Krishna is in everyone's heart as super soul. So this is how we were instructed that as we develop our Krishna consciousness more, we do have affection towards all living entities. We are all saying we don't want anybody to, any, any living entity to suffer. Um, and uh, we have affection and only in that level that, you know, we can actually show true mercy and to compassion for other living entities. And that's why we, it doesn't matter where they come from or what background or whatever. It's not that we are proving ourselves to be pure and others are not. We felt compassion for everyone who is suffering in this material world, going through the cycle of birth, death, old age, disease. It's all suffering, you know, and then particularly in this present time when all these diseases and the, you know, effect is felt by and so many people are suffering. But then also there are sufferings of all the different living entities, particularly cows in the slaughterhouses and all that, and we feel the compassion for them. So Krishna is in everyone's heart as a super soul, um, or even all living entities. So that's what we have to understand. These are some pastimes of Krishna, then later on of Agasur and uh, killing of all the demons and Krishna protecting all the coward boys and uh, all the calves. And this is pastimes. This is where Krishna is enjoying this re relationship with all the coward boys. Um, and when Brahma sees that, you know, it's just how Krishna reciprocates with all the coward boys on such a level enjoying the food, the share, and have a picnic like that. So it's wonderful. Like a world of lotus flowers surrounded by its petals and leaves, Krishna sat in the center and circled by lines of his friends who all looked very beautiful. Every one of them was trying to look forward towards Krishna, thinking that Krishna might look towards them, toward him. In this way, they all enjoyed their lunch in the forest. So just like the gopis, when the Rasadans think that, you know, Krishna is dancing with me and I'm special. Every coward boy felt, oh, Krishna is looking at me and reciprocating with me like that. But Krishna can do that. It's amazing. So that's one of the pastimes. This is when Krishna expands himself. And, to, and then when Brahma sees this, they actually Krishna, these are all these coward boys are actually Krishna in, in the form of Narayan then he realizes the supreme uh, mystic power of Krishna. And then he realizes his uh, um, ego and how he had made an offense or such. Up to this time, even Balaram was captivated by the bewilderment, the bewilderment that covered Brahma. Even Balaram did not know that all the calves and cowherd boys were expansions of Krishna, and that he himself had also an expansion of Krishna. This was disclosed to Balaram just five or six days before the completion of the year. So this Balaram got to realize that, you know, very late before this completion of the whole year, that actually even um, this, this Krishna has expanded into all this, even Balaram was. Not only that, even Brahma started to realize that he is also an expansion of Krishna in a way, because we are all part and parcel of this. Is when Krishna, Balara, Brahma, Lord Brahma is actually um, generally, you know, he is offering prayers 
After seeing this, Lord Brahma hastily got down from his swan carrier, fell down like a golden rod, and touched the lotus feet of Lord Krishna with the tips of his four crowns on his head, offering his obeisance as he bathed the lotus feet of Krishna with the water of his tears of joy. So he obviously, um, I think I found this little bit, which was quite interesting to purport to that verse. And if anybody would like to join in reading this, it would be very nice, because this is actually how Balaram, uh, it, it explains a little bit further how Balaram, um, Lord Brahma actually bows down and how, what his prayers were like. So I'll read the first bit, and if anybody wants to, then by all means, uh, I'll, I'll put it up, it come up anyway. Lord, Lord, Bar Lord Brahma, bow down like a stick. And because Lord Brahma's complexion is golden, he appeared to be like a golden stick lying down before Lord Krishna. When one falls down before a superior, just like a stick, one's offering of obeisances is, is called dandavas. Danda means stick and vata means like. It is not that one should simply say dandavas. Rather, one must fall down. Thus Brahma fell down, touching his forehead to the lotus feet of Krishna, and his crying in ecstasy is regarded as an Abhishek bathing ceremony of Krishna's lotus feet. Anybody wants to read this bit? I'll do. He who appeared before Brahma as a human child was in fact the absolute truth. Para Brahman, Brahmati Parama, Parama, Paramati, it's very small writing, that's why Bhagavan I can't it. The Supreme Lord is Narakriti, that is, he resembles a human being. It is not that he is four-armed Chaturbhuj Narayan. is Chaturbhuj, but the Supreme Personality resembles a human being. This is also confirmed in the Bible, where it is said, that the man was made in the Im image of God. So this part here where he says, you know, the, um, Narayan is Chaturbahu, but the Supreme Personality resembles a human being. We are made in the image of Krishna. So our form is like humans, my beings are as close to a God. So what he says, you know, in the, in the Bible, Man is made in the image of God, and that's why Krishna is like playing flute with his two arms, and then he looks like a human being, but he is transcendental. Okay, there are two, two of these. So I thought this was nice. You know, Lord Brahma saw that Krishna, in his form as a coward boy, was Parbrahman, the root cause of everything, but was now appearing as a human child, loitering in Vrindavan with a morsel of food in his hand. Astonished, Lord Brahma hastily got down from his swan carrier and let his body fall to the ground. Usually, the demigods never touch the ground. But Lord Brahma, voluntarily giving up his prestige as a demigod, bowed down on the ground before Krishna. Although Brahma has one head in each direction, he voluntarily brought all his heads to the ground and touch Krishna's feet with the tips of his four helmets. Although his intelligence shame, the negative test. I know, come on, positive. Although his intelligence works in every direction, absolutely... he surrendered everything Father before the boy Krishna. The they have. Jesus. It is mentioned that Brahma washed the feet of Krishna with his tears and hear the words Sujale, Sujale indicates that his tears were purified. As soon as bhakti is present, everything is purified. Sarvopadi vinir muktam. Therefore, Brahma's crying was a form of bhakti anubhava, a transformation of transcendental ecstatic love. So this is nice, you know, when it explains a little bit more about the, what actually bhakti is and in bhakti what actually happens that everything does get purified okay thank you and uh, that was a little bit uh, expansion on so then you know this is where we get the instruction that lord brahma offers prayers to the lord now that krishna is freed him from illusion 
and he thus instructs us as to how we experience many emotions due to our misidentifications with the body as being real. Just as we would feel relief when we realize it's a rope, no snake, as we, we're standing on in a total darkness. So once we realize the truth that we are not the body, then you know, our emotions change. Um, our, when, when we are, it's a big being like if you're misinformed about something, then you, 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 one, one is leading a life in a misinformed way and then misidentification and everything. So once, the, once this is the first step in direction of spiritual life, the Bhagavad Gita starts that first of all, we have to understand this illusion has to be, we, should, we have to become just like Lord Brahma, we have to become free from that illusion that we are not this body as such, you know. And our emotions would change after that. Otherwise, we are emotionally attached to the body and any pain and then we spend our time just mourning and groaning about our aches and pain, this and that. But it's transcendental. So we rise, we try and rise above and just, Srila Prabhupada clears and clarifies and discovering that we are actually an eternal soul within the body. We naturally focus our attention on that real self. So this is actually what happens. You know, we, we, we start to focus on all the, the, the true self that we actually are. Uh, a bit like the real diamond that's been covered up with some real mud. And the glory of the diamond needs to be revealed, but the mud has been, it's been covered up with such a thick layer of mud that the true glory of the diamond is not being exposed or rather revealed and, and expressed as well. So the diamond wants to reveal its beauty and its glory and its um, qualities, but the crack, the mud layer needs to break. And at one, some point it starts to happen that the thick layer of mud starts to crack, break, and then the, the glory of the diamonds gets exposed. It does happen that way. So this is how we have to realize. Those who are saintly and wise always cultivate Krishna consciousness, spiritual knowledge, having transcended the foolish identification, misidentification of the body as the self. Such Krishna consciousness person go on to realize the Supreme Personality of Godhead who dwells within the material body as the super soul, the witness and the guide of every living entity. So we're just not just soul on its own. We, even Krishna is there as a super soul. Uh, and, and, and as we move away from this misidentification, then we realize the Supreme Personality of God is dwelling within a super soul as well. Chapter 15, the coward boys were eager for Krishna and Balaram to exhibit their pastimes by, of, of killing demons and to enjoy the delicious fruits of the Tala forest. And therefore they made the request to go to this Tala forest only if Krishna and Balaram considered the concept was appealing. So in this pastime, the coward boys, they heard about this Tala forest and some delicious fruits that were actually in that. Some were lying on the ground, some are growing up in the trees. But they wanted to taste them and, and uh, smell them. They could smell them, they were in enough and said, we should go and taste them if only you, you, you feel it's right to do so. But that fruit was being protected by this demon, you know, which, uh, um, and, and, and that demon, what was his name? Yeah, that demon. And, and then Krishna and Balaram, Balaram has to go and fight with that demon. And then, so we should understand that this request of the coward boys is motivated by love and not their personal desire. So it's their love for Krishna and said, Krishna, can you just, you know, let's go and explore this area only if it's okay with you. So that's the pastime in chapter 15. Um, and they go to that forest and, and they enjoy their fruit. 
after having killing that demon who was protecting all that fruit. Chapter 16, the pastimes of the Lord with Kaliya are, are amazing and wonderful. And only Krishna acts in a way of saving the residents of Vrindavan from Kaliya, saving Kaliya himself from Garuda, and bestowing grace upon both the victims of violence and the committer of that violence. So but there, you know, whenever there's violence, there's the committer of the violence, and then there are the victims of the violence. But then this situation is such that Krishna can save both of them actually. And there is Garuda, and there is Kaliya. Uh, I found a little bit of an expansion on this a little, so I'll try and go through that. And because Kaliya's wives were great devotees of the Lord and offered him love, loving affection, Krishna withdrew Karshanam both Kaliya's offense against the Lord's devotee Garuda and that against the residents of Vrindavan who were very dear to him. So obviously this situation with Kaliya and Garuda is a little bit explained that um, in Garuda was, uh, this, is, this, this shows Krishna's causeless mercy. So in saving, so this is Kaliya. And I think Kaliya was living in the Yamuna River and he could live there because of some incident that happened before where I think I found this little bit. Garuda, the carrier of Lord Vishnu, would come to Yamuna River to catch and eat fish. This didn't go down well with Sobri Muni who, that lived there. So if you remember, you know, in chapter in Canto 9, Sobri Muni, he is meditating under in the river and he starts to have affection for the fish and he starts to think that he's meditated in this um, you know, river for such a long time and his affection for the fish led him to his fall down as well. But because Garuda you come and catch the fish, he was deeply attached to the fish. Sabri Muni cursed Garuda saying, Henceforth, from this day, if Garuda comes here, he will Im be immediately killed. So he actually, Sabri Muni had that power because of his meditation, all that. But just to curse Garuda like that, that you'll be immediately killed, was not a right thing for him to do. But he does it. The snakes are always fearful of Garuda as Garuda eats them. And Garuda had beaten Kaliya in the past. So Kaliya knew this curse and therefore he started living in Yamuna. So Kaliya started living in Yamuna and he felt safe there because of that reason. But then he was polluting the river and then, uh, you know, he was creating poisonous and for the residents of Rindavan. So that was becoming um, a, a difficult situation. So Krishna somehow had to resolve this whole situation of Kaliya being in that situation, he doesn't actually kill him, but just because of his dancing on Krishna's Kaliya's head and physically touching him, Kaliya does get purified because of Krishna's contact with Kaliya in that way. And Kaliya's wives were amazingly, they were the devotees of Krishna. Somehow they also uh, pray to. So in this chapter, we get to understand how Sobri Muni curses Garuda, who then could not come near the lake, near Ram river, Yamuna River. He does this under the impression that he was mercifully acting for the benefit of the lake's residents. So Sobri Muni thinks he is doing a merciful act. And uh, we are then instructed in the purport that when we that when our so-called compassion does not tally with the order of the Supreme Lord, it merely causes a disturbance. So when we show compassion, it has to be in line and in order with, with, with Krishna's Supreme Personality of God is so that, you know, it, it doesn't cause any disturbances as such. We have to understand how to be compassionate, taking into consideration the order of the Supreme Lord. So that has its own place. 
chapter 18, 19. These chapters reveal the simple, sublime relationship with Krishna and his pure devotees, uh, and how cowherd boys enjoy different sports and games in Vrindavan, and they totally depend and remain surrendered, surrounded to Krishna and Balaram. Amazingly, how the absolute truth, the supreme almighty Lord, is actually a young, blissful cowherd boy named Krishna. God is youthful and his mentality is playful as well. And at the same time, we learn how Prabhupada, how Pralamba and the forest fire were actually dealt with. So there was an incident where Krishna swallows up the whole fire and then the Pralamba has been attacked uh, and killed. There are lots of comparisons made with the seasons in Vrindavan with life concepts and principles of material life. So this seasons in Vrindavan, I think chapter 20 starts to describe about how the different seasons and the atmosphere in Vrindavan and uh, it's beautiful. So in the evening, twilight during the rainy season, the darkness allowed the glowworms but not the stars to shine forth, just as in the age of Kali, the predominance of sinful activities allow atheistic doctrines to overshadow the true knowledge of the Vedas. So it's not surprising that Sanatan Dharma has been subdued and overtaken by some false and uh, um, other doctrines which are like atheistic, you know, like Mayavad and other religions and conversions and we're being drifted away from the true knowledge of the Vedas, which is the Sanatana Dharma. And uh, it actually, in the age of Kali, that is, was, that is, you know, sinful activities actually uh, leads to these atheistic viewpoints. And then this is what happens, you know, so Prabhupada comments that in the age of Kali, persons who are atheists or miscreants become very prominently visible. Whereas persons who are actually following the Vedic principles for spiritual emancipation are practically obscured. So yeah, you know, even Prabhupada tried he, on his own single-handedly when he came out in America, you know, he was the single person amongst all the atheistic <laughs> viewpoints and he was being attacked you know, and, and it's very hard for him, but certainly Sanatana Dharma is very much obscured at the moment, even in Bharat, people are trying to, you know, over the political agendas and other, um, predom you know, dominated by other viewpoints, even within the parliament, it's all been manipulated, all education system is, drifted towards being uh, of you know the, not to reveal the true sanatan dharma but nowadays it's more and more coming out because of social media we find that actually the true concept of swadharma or swatantra meaning independence of india or bharat was actually swatantra meaning you know independence not uh, freedom. It wasn't in the India it didn't become free, but he became swa, Swatantra. So it gives a in, there's a bit of difference between independence and being made free. <laughs> so we were just made independent. It means you can be independent, but but more and more, you know, the education system was manipulated by the education ministers like. Mulan Azad, he was the first education minister after independence of India. And he and then and it drove the history of the education, education system not to reveal people like Ram, Krishna, Arjuna, Mahabharata was subdued, made obscured. Uh, um, Shivaji and other personalities were made obscured. And other personalities like Aurangzeb, uh, you know, all those people were made to be heroes, you know. So 
find out what the real heroes of Sanatan Dharma are, and more and more people will find that out, then all these other miscreants and atheistic viewpoints can be subdued a bit. But anyway, that's my comments you know, on that. Chapter 21, in the purport of 20, verse 21, Srila Prabhupada comments, this verse indicates that the transcendental sound of the flute of Krishna extended to all corners of the universe. So in this chapter where he's describing how Krishna plays his flute, the atmosphere in Vrindavan, and it's so beautiful, and the sound, the transcendental sound of the Krishna's flute is not just heard within Vrindavan, but it reaches to all corners of the universe. It is significant that the gopis knew about the different kinds of airplanes flying around in the sky. So there's a description of how gopis we're actually talking about you know different kinds of airplanes flying in the sky in the higher planetary system. So we don't we're not aware of that. But the Gopi's description of Krishna's flute playing is amazing, as further comments of Srila Prabhupada reflects reflects on musical talent itself as more than art. So Indra, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu being primordial gods travel throughout the universe and have extensive knowledge of the science of music. And yet, even these great personalities have never heard or composed music like that, which emanates from Krishna's flute. So music in itself in the Vedas is a science, the science of music. And that's why, you know, uh, Karuna Vandar sings so wonderfully because she's music teacher, I think, and she knows a lot more about music, different ragas and all that. And it's such a deep science. And gopis were amazing at this sort of composing all that. But what actually emanates from Krishna's flute is not even the best of the musicians, musicians can actually uh, emanate, uh, compose like that. So that's Krishna, all oh, everything you know, emanates from Krishna's flute is amazing. Um, chapter, I don't know, I'm, how am I doing for time, Prabhuji? Uh, so you can stop continue here. tomorrow. If, if yeah, you are you joining us tomorrow? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I will be. I'll do chapter 22 here. Yeah, you know, yeah. First okay. 30 months, and then I'll stop here, okay? Yeah. So Lord Krishna says, all stalk of Krishna and Amsu, all Siddhama, Subala and Arjuna, O Vrishabha, O Jasvi, Deva Prashta, and Varutapa. Just see these greatly fortunate trees whose lives are completely dedicated to the benefit of others. Even while tolerating the wind, rain, heat, and snow, they protect us from all those elements. So here Krishna is actually glorifying the trees and that's why, you know, when we talk about climate change and deforestation and everything, we don't realize that why in Sanatana Dharma, we worship trees like people tree and Ashoka tree and the different types of trees are there. And uh, they dedicate the whole life, to giving us oxygen, shelter. Sometimes in a very sunny day, you know, you want the shade of the trees and uh, you know, this is for our benefits. And when we are about in this country, now this autumn has gone through, we've experienced the fall of all the trees and leaves, and we see all the different colors appearing. And then in the springtime, the colors will reappear in different shades of colors and green, such add beauty to it. So they tolerate the wind, the rain, the snow, and they protect us from all these different elements giving us oxygen that's why we worship trees and forest and planting more trees is recommended but we also support them by breathing out carbon dioxide which they need a bit of science there so Srila Prabhupada instructs that the Lord indicates that even trees who are dedicated to the welfare of others are superior to Brahmins who are not certainly the members of Krishna conscious movement should soberly study this point so we're made to realize that you know for the welfare of others trees are even regarded as superior 
Okay, I'll stop there, Prabhuji. It's a really interesting point. I like that. The trees are more superior than the Brahmins who don't care, who don't live for others. Really interesting point. Really good. Yeah. Well, there's everything in Srimad Bhagavatam is amazing because the whole Sanatan principle is there to be in harmony with nature. And, and you know, then and it's sustainable because we protect cows, um, we protect the trees, we worship the rivers, Yamuna, Ganga, although they're so much polluted and all that, but they're still part of this universe and they descend from the spiritual realm. And Ganga, you know, we've, we've studied that, you know, how Ganga descends into this spiritual material world. But, you know, it's still, this is, this is what, it is Sanatana Dharma, is a science, you know, it's not really just some atheist kind of, kind of a doctrine or something like that, no. But anyway, Krishna is, you know, revealing more and more in the Srimad Bhagavatam in these pastimes. So thank you very much. Jai Shri Prabhupada ki jai, Guru Mahat ki jai, Sri Sanatana Dharma ki jai. Madhusan Prabhu ki jai, thank you very much. Oh, any questions, any comments? I'm here again in the dark. By the time you get to read, you don't realize <laughs> the weather is so bad outside, actually, you know, so windy and you know, all, they just don't feel like it. Anyway, thank you, Haribo. Okay, Hare Krishna.